I'm Duncan McLeod, and this is Tech Central. Find us on YouTube at youtube.com slash techcentral. I'm very excited about my next interview. I'm joined on a video call now by none other than Leon Lowe, and he's the executive director of the Free Market Foundation for what is going to be a chat about the telecom sector, um, but I suspect may become a much broader discussion about the economy and the lockdown. Leon, it's good to see you again. Uh, Thanks for making the time to chat. It's a pleasure to be with you, Duncan, and whoever the viewers and listeners will be. So, um, Leon, I thought a good place to start before we talk tech, before we talk about the telecom sector and your views on it, uh, is uh, let's, let's have a little discussion about the lockdown because it's on everyone's lips, of course, at the moment. Um, in your view, was the lockdown necessary? No, I, I'm afraid uh, my view is that it has not been necessary, and that view is shared by various small and informal business organizations like NAP, NAPCOC and Archip and Karting Hawkers and so on with whom we associate and work. And uh, it, 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 at best, uh, could save a very small number of lives. Um, but it's likely not even to do that. It simply flattens the curve, which means it's easier for uh, healthcare services to deal with them. But even then, the ones they don't deal with, the mortality would be very low in particular in South Africa because we have a low average age population and you know the data from Italy and elsewhere tells us Spain and so on that age is a very important determinant and we of course do have some old people here but actually not that many so we're a young country and therefore not at risk but more importantly uh, the question is what does the lockdown achieve It is full of extraordinarily, and you can't be polite about it, stupid aspects. I mean, one is this business of having to have a receipt for when you bought your cigarettes. Uh, You know, the government has some very fantastic connection with the virus and has persuaded the virus to affect only people who have old cigarettes, as if as if there's some logic to this. So, and now we've got a new liquor thing that, that d- depending on when you bought the liquor, somehow the virus knows and will affect you. <laughs> yes. Uh, these measures have no scientific validity. They have no health validity. And in fact, they're quite the opposite. Uh, so what we must say is, you know, people move around, they go into uh, taxis, buses, shopping centers, but they can't swim in the sea or they can't walk their dog or couldn't until now. So there was just never any logic whatsoever. So the question is, what should they have done? What they did made no sense by any definition, any criteria at all. So what should they have done? And what they should have done is remembered that the South African police used to be called the South African Police Force under apartheid. In the new South Africa, it became the South African Police Service. So they should have been a service. They should have been along with soldiers going around, handing out masks, sanitizer, gloves, explaining to people uh, how to be safe, uh, social distancing, etc. That would have been effective and useful uh, and would in fact save lives. Whereas the lockdown has led to a massive destruction of the economy. And let's understand that. Uh, Duncan, the the contraction in the GDP, according to various economists, eminent economists like Darby Ruth, we're looking at 10 to 15 percent. Now, poverty kills people. There's a very tight correlation in the world between GDP and poverty, or GDP per capita, and mortality, or life expectancy. The point is, it's, it's one of the tightest correlations there is. And it's really very simple. It tells you that if countries are richer, people live longer and mortality falls. And this will cause probably in the vicinity of a few hundred thousand extra deaths per annum as a result of the contraction caused to the economy. So the damage to the economy is much more dangerous than COVID would have been had nothing been done at all. And if all they had done was to to participate, to, to do... Uh, public service and consult people on how to be healthy, healthy living, that would indeed have saved lives and the economy would not have contracted. That would have saved lives. What has happened now is we've caused poverty which kills people. You know, we need to understand that. This is not trading off profit against life and all of this rhetoric we've heard. No, 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 no. Poverty 
kills, and it kills more than COVID kills. Do you think that uh, there's an ulterior motive here by the government? You know, I'm not into conspiracy theories, but the conspiracy theories are very tempting when you try to explain something that seems completely devoid of logical reason. Conspiracy theories fill the gap. They seem to provide an explanation. Why would they do something as idiotic as the tobacco uh, sale prohibition, which is virtually nowhere else in the world? If there was any logic to it, any science to it, then it would have been a commonplace thing around the world. And as far as we can establish, there might be only one or two other countries out of the world's 220,000, I mean, sorry, 220 countries. So in other words, no one else has done this. It is considered to be, uh, it, it has no logic. So why would they do it? And of course, the conspiracy theories abound, is that they are invested in and getting benefits from the underground and illicit economy, which was taken off like a rocket. Mm -hmm. uh, already we had a quarter to a third of all tobacco products sold illegally. And during this lockdown, uh, pretty much everyone who wanted to got them illegally. In other words, what the government has done is boosted the illicit illegal trade spectacularly and has caused the people who didn't get tobacco products to suffer terribly emotionally and psychologically Tobacco causes, uh, you know, helps people cope with depression and loneliness and stress and, uh, and, and concentration disorders and eating and drinking disorders. So there are very, very important psychological benefits to smoking, which I have never done. So I speak as a lifelong non-smoker, but it's quite clear and the World Health Organization lists benefits of smoking. People are often surprised to know that they are. So the extent to which they stopped smoking has inflicted on people who would have smoked enormous costs, psychologically, sociologically, stress-wise, and that in turn could have resulted in more domestic violence, more child and women abuse and so on, is that the people who would normally smoke were unable to do so, or had to divert lots of money from healthier things food, clothing, blankets, soap, whatever, toothpaste, uh, into tobacco. So what the government has done is something that seems completely devoid of logic or any reason whatsoever. Why would they have done it? Of course, the conspiracy theory says it's because of the association, for example, of people in the Zuma family uh, with illicit tobacco. Uh, I don't know. I, I can I just say that it, it, it's very hard to explain there does seem to be some weird ulterior motive. Uh, even liquor seems a bit peculiar because the illegal uh, liquor market has boomed mm -hmm. and, uh, and is booming. And uh, we see today that, that people can buy liquor. Many stores didn't have customers. So they were all getting it somewhere. There wasn't the, the stampede predicted. So it, it, all it did was raise the price. Why would they do that? there might be some vested interest, but it has no science, no health logic whatsoever. Other measures have no science or no health logic, like people not being allowed to walk their dogs or surf or, or climb mountains or do whatever. Uh, but nonetheless, you could drive around in taxis and you could go to shopping centers. Uh, again, uh, there just seems to be extraordinary lack of logic or science or common sense mm. uh, to the whole thing. Do you think the industry uh, rolled over too easily? Do you think that that uh, business should have perhaps confronted the government more aggressively in the courts over some of these bans? I'm I'm thinking back to the the uh, Patel Minister Patel's decision to ban unfettered e-commerce, for example, which he later um, uh, retracted or moved back from that position. Um, we've belatedly seen BAT SA uh, taking the government to court over the cigarette ban. Do you think that uh, Do you think that the industry should have been uh, much more forceful in its criticism? of the lockdown measures and, and um, perhaps been quicker to take uh, some of the, these to, uh, to for review at the courts? It's easy for me and tempting for me to say yes, but we need to understand something important here. The people who speak for industry, their consultants, their senior executives and managers, uh, all are, you know, living in luxury, middle and upper middle class, upper class homes, they're the wealthy, the, the people who are unaffected. In fact, mm. they were better off. They were able to stay home. They were able to get the same income. It suited them perfectly, and there was no reason whatsoever why they should have been more aggressive or more assertive. 
Uh, the damage, the devastation caused to a given big company, uh, you know, is a bit of a setback, but not too serious. The devastation was caused to the small and independent businesses, and they, people like NAFCOC um, and small, in the, at SHIB, the African Council of Hawkers and Informal Businesses, the people representing where there was absolute carnage and devastation, uh, they were the ones devastated, and they were loud, and they issued press releases. They sent open letters to the president and so on. So big business behaved as you might expect, which is it doesn't want to upset the government. It doesn't want to be victimized. It wants to be politically correct. And more importantly, the people who speak for big business were completely unaffected. They, they, were, they were happy. They were having a free holiday, paid holiday. Yeah. So why would they bother? Good points. Um, Leon, the president spoke to, um, to editors uh, yesterday via, I think it was via Zoom, um, and he made a number of remarks, including stating that, uh, that it's an opportune time on the back of COVID-19 to restructure the economy. Uh, many people, including the Free Market Foundation, have been calling for market-friendly structural reforms for years. Um, do you think that's what the president has in mind, or is it something altogether more sinister? It's a bit confusing, and within the ANC, of course, there are different tendencies and factions, and there are what are typically called the left, and then they're typically called the moderates or, or the uh, 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 pro-market uh, people. But the president himself and the minister of finance, Tito Mbaweni, do appear as uh, the the the, uh, uh, the head of the uh, of the of the SAB, South African Reserve Bank, for example, Lesetje Kanyaga. Now, they are all pro-market, and they have been saying the right things, and they have, uh, whether they will prevail is another matter. Uh, Tito Mbawedi issued a eight-point plan to deal with the crisis before the lockdown. Remember, this is a crisis upon a crisis. We, were, we had stagnated. In other words, we were in some kind of recession. Yes. Now we have been just plunged into extraordinary poverty of a kind that is unprecedented in South African history. Not even the, the 1930s depression uh, mm -hmm. took us down this fast, this far. So yes, the structural reforms, unfortunately, they don't seem to be talking the right language or they talk with pork tongue. You know, this ludicrous idea of starting another South African Airways, which <laughs> is a peculiar old apartheid dinosaur. Yeah. Uh, the ANC somehow fell in love with everything it inherited from apartheid and wants to perpetuate it regardless of the cost. It doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand it. Even now going back to police having to enforce idiotic laws as they had to under apartheid. So uh, what they should do is very simple. There are about eight indices measuring economic systems in the world, and they are the World Bank Doing Business Index, the Heritage and Wall Street Journal, Economic Freedom Index, the Fraser, and the one we're involved with, the Economic Freedom of the World, and the Competitiveness Index of the World Economic Forum, and Freedom House Index, and so on, and the Corruption Perceptions Index. Basically, all of these indices that have objective measurements of the system in a country show all the countries at the top are the same. In other words, you, you have less, less corruption and you have lower, the, the country risk guide gives you less risk and so on if you're more of a free market. Property rights index, all of these indexes tell you the same thing. Mm. So what you do is really not rocket science. It's very simple. You, you can really, anybody can do this, get onto the internet, look up, for example, uh, the Economic Freedom of the World Index. There are about 42 items in it, objective measures, uh, the legal system, the property rights, the budgetary, the size of government relative to the economy, they're all there. And uh, these are put together in a composite index. And what is very clear from that is that you, if you have a freer economy as objectively measured, you have more growth and prosperity. And if you have a less free economy, you have less growth and prosperity. Or to be subtle and technical, if you move towards a freer economy, even if you're unfree, your economy takes off like a rocket, mm -hmm. which has happened in various African countries. And if you free and you move away from it, your economy stagnates, even if you are relatively free. Now, that's quite subtle. What's more important than your economic system, in other words, is the direction of reform. Now, 
in South Africa, if the president and minister of finance and other ministers can be brought on board, it's quite simple. If you just get us moving up the index, we've moved down uh, since the Zuma years from about 40th to about 120th. <laughs> uh, during apartheid, that's what we did. After apartheid under Mandela and Mbeki, we moved up from about 120th to about 40th, and the economy grew. Jobs were created, foreign direct investment. So we just have to do that again. Just turn us around, start moving up the index. The laws of economics are very generous. They don't require you to make big reforms. They just require you to reform in the right direction. And then the laws of economics will reward you very generously. And then once rewarded, you get hooked on it and you move even further and faster, which is fine. But just stop the decline. That is what they must do now immediately. If they do that, we will go immediately overnight into 2, 3, 4% growth, having stagnated close to zero now for the last five years. And if you really move up the scale the way, for example, China did with the special economic zones, the way India did with its economic reform program, the way Mauritius has done, the way Rwanda has done, all the high growth countries in the world, they just simply move up the index fast and they started growing at 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 percent. We, we can grow at, for example, 10 percent. And just so people understand what that means, if you grow at 10 percent, your wealth doubles every seven years. It's the rule of seven. If you grow at 7 percent, your wealth doubles every 10 years. In other words, if we had grown at 7% since 1994, we would now be one of the world's wealthiest countries. So economic growth is extraordinarily impactful on the quality of life, the welfare, and the life expectancy. So if you want people in South Africa to live and to have a high life expectancy and you want to reduce mortality, nothing comes anywhere near getting the economy to grow. That is by far the best thing you can do for health. Uh, as uh, I like to put it, a, a wealthy economy is a healthy economy. And this means less socialism, more free markets, right? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's not debatable. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you are more socialistic or you move towards more socialism, your economy stagnates and contracts. If you move away towards a market economy, your economy grows. There are pretty much no exceptions in the world. One or two exceptions are particularly curious situations, for example, Israel. Uh, there's special reasons for that. The world's experience tells you it is straightforward. There are no exceptions. Everyone who becomes freer prospers. Everyone who has less of a free market and more socialism stagnates and contracts. It is not rocket science. It is not an opinion, it is a fact. These are, you can have your own opinion, but these are the, this is the data, this is what it tells you, and there are no exceptions. And it's not complicated. You don't need another committee and another plan and another government agency, you know, looking up and concerned some committee that advises the president. No, the president should get on the internet Look at the economic freedom of the world index and start ticking the boxes. Let's do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then that is the reform we need, and that will bring about prosperity. Why is socialism still so popular, Leon? Oh, I can understand that. And, you know, uh, I was a Marxist. I was a socialist. Well, to the left of socialist, I was a, a Marxist-Leninist revolutionary, effectively, and I was in the anti-apartheid movement. And so I come from there. I imbibed all the philosophy and the ideology. And the reason is because it just seems fair, just. You want people to be cared for. You want people to be have human dignity and equality. And the objectives and the rhetoric sound nuts. I mean, mm. who's against uh, people being looked after and people having welfare, and people having health care? You know, every decent, normal human being wants that. The, so socialists simply just sort of say, well, wouldn't that be nice? It's a kind of Santa Claus approach. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, what actually produces equality, and I stress equality, people must understand that freer markets are more equal uh, on, the, on the International Equality Index. 
So freer markets produce better health, better quality of life, more housing, more jobs, higher pay, longer life expectancy, absolutely everything that's considered a human virtue. Mm -hmm. And a natural virtue, cleaner environments, cleaner rivers, less endangered species, cleaner air. So the more socialism you have, which people go to because it feels nice, it mm. sounds nice, it's decent, it's caring. You know, don't you want a caring society? Don't you want to think about people instead of profit? This rhetoric is so seductive, so tempting. Uh, and you come along and say, no, we want capital formation and we want uh, direct, foreign direct investment and we want higher profits and we want executives, we want the world's most expensive and best executives and so on. You're not going to get nice, decent, caring people on your side. Uh, it is strange, though, that free market people and libertarians and classical liberals don't do what socialists do and say the reason you need a market economy is because it's fair and it's kind and it produces housing and educates children and provides health care and, and provides well-being. And, uh, but for some reason, my kindred spirits, and I suspect yours, somehow think you can persuade people in the street that they should be for the profit motive you know, or, or capital formation. You know, that doesn't sell. If you say what I want is equality, justice, fairness, high living standards, good education, good health care, good housing, uh, good policing, safety and security, less crime, uh, child and women protection, etc., which is what free markets actually provide. That's what they deliver. And if only I could persuade people who are for the market to start saying that's their objective. What they deliver should be their objective. But unfortunately, uh, it's the objective of socialists, the objective of socialists, uh, despite the fact that they don't deliver. Now, let me just point this out. Socialism is a bit like pick and pay, or Woolworths, or Macro, or whatever it is. You know, choose a you know, shop right, whatever. Saying, uh, you know, buy, buy from us. We will provide you with the best and the most food, and we will look after you. We will make you happy. And you go and shop there, and you go away with an empty shopping shop. In other words, they promise groceries, but don't deliver groceries. This is what socialism does. Socialism is a supplier who promises but doesn't deliver. And people keep going back to the same supplier. It's, mm. it's really very peculiar and very sad, actually. So after the lockdown, both here in South Africa and worldwide, do you think we're going to see more socialism or less socialism? You know, it is the old joke says you must not make predictions, especially not about the future, <laughs> or the future is not what it used to be. Now, there's some truth in that, interestingly. The future is not what it used to be, and quite what it is going to be now is not so clear. I think the future was a long-term trend in the world towards freer markets, towards democracy, in other words, in the right direction. And, uh, and uh, sorry, sorry, I, I didn't turn this off. Let me just do that quickly. My apology. No problem at all. I don't know able to clip this, but there we are. Um, uh, the, so w what we've had in the world is a long-term trend. And let's take our continent, Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, or what used to be called Black Africa. It has about 50 countries. Uh, at 20, 30 years ago, only one of them was at least nominally a democracy, namely Botswana. There were no other democracies. None of them had market economies. Now all are democracies, at least nominally, some maybe not as much so as others, but their human rights, their property rights, their market economies, most have abolished exchange control, which we still keep, another apartheid relic, which the the success of apartheid fell in love with. I don't know why they love what apartheid did so much, but one of them. <laughs> well, they. Uh, I've often hear it said, Leon, that uh, the the uh, ANC and the Nats were actually very similar. One was a, a, a white uh, nationalist socialist party, and now we have a black nationalist socialist party. There's a lot of truth in that. Yes, and so uh, you know, and, and exchange control, which we are amongst the few countries in the world that still have it even our immediate neighbors don't anymore, uh, was invented by the Nazi regime. We, in, we imported it straight from Hitler mm -hmm. and still sit with it. 
So what, uh, what we should have in the world is that where African countries have been moving, the whole world, but Africa in particular, has been moving in the right direction, and therefore Africa went from being the only region in the world that contracted during the last generation of the last century. Everywhere else grew, only Africa contracted. Africa is now the highest growth region in the world. So what happened? It wasn't about race or culture or history or colonization or any of those things. Very simply that African countries started adopting democracies and market economies. So they started growing. Now this long-term trend, the question is, will it continue or be reversed because of uh, this COVID pandemic? And uh, I'm hoping that in South Africa, they say, the desperate need for growth now, having devastated the economy like this, uh, in, inflicted this carnage on the economy, uh, that we now must do what produces growth. That's a hope. That's a hope. What the, what the president has been talking about is the government doing more, yes. stimulating, investing, whatever. That would be quite the wrong thing and make things worse. So uh, well, the, the hope is that this uh, COVID thing might well give the world a kick in the pants and a boost towards market economies to overcome the losses that have been curved and promote prosperity. That is really where we hope it will go. Uh, the, the South African government has not so far had the right conversation, with the exception of the Treasury and the Ministry of Finance and the Reserve Bank, the Central mm -hmm. Bank, have been mm -hmm. saying the right things. And to some extent, the president although the president has been ambivalent and, and let's say vague. Using the term structural reform or structural adjustment itself means nothing. You say, you have to have a list. We are going to change the following. We are going to dismantle the market conduct authority and allow financial markets to be free. You know, we are going to uh, remove exchange control and allow freedom of movement of currency. We are going to lower taxes and encourage investment and reward people for being productive. We are going to remove the following bits of red tape. Uh, housing restrictions, for example, in how you can build houses for the poor, which is technically at the moment is currently illegal. Mm -hmm. uh, it's forbidden to build low-income housing unless you are the government building RDP housing because of the township and the housing and the building code and other laws. So what you need is a checklist go down, tick the boxes and say, these are the specific things mm -hmm. we are going to change. Not vague statements, we're going to have reform. That itself means nothing. Mm -hmm. And it could be in the wrong direction. You want to have, these are concrete measures that are going to be changed. Red tape is going to be reduced so that registering a company takes one day instead of a few months. Uh, we are going to remove all the restrictions on small and informal business. We are going to remove the requirement for small business to have zoning, for example. So the township tuck shops and spaza shops and backyard mechanics and people making burglar bars and carpenters and so on are all lawful. Instead of now, they're unlawful and they have to pay bribes and they're banned by zoning and licensing and other laws. So it is not, it is, it is really, you draw up a list. What are the things that make it difficult to employ? What are the things that make it difficult to invest? What are the things that make it difficult to get reward for doing the right thing and hard work and investment and just fix those? Mm. It, it, it really is you know, a weekend workshop of vaguely intelligent people saying, let's write up on the board what are the things that make it difficult to prosper, to employ, to start a business, to profit to run a business, to have secure property rights. Uh, you know, for it take national health, which they have now, you know, sort of implied that we, this is now an excuse to go for NHI, national yes. health insurance. Yeah. National health insurance is a complete misnomer. It is not insurance. It's the prohibition of insurance, which is a strange thing. Uh, health insurance is actually banned in South Africa, apart from a little bit of uh, what's called gap cover. And so what you want to do is say, no, the government is not going to run healthcare. It's manifestly failed at that and bad at it. What it will do is it will pay the premium for people to buy healthcare, in other words, real insurance, national health insurance, and allow people to insure themselves 
because private healthcare providers and all South Africans, rich and poor, will have the, the world's best healthcare. Mm. I do worry about uh, the fact that the president doesn't even be able, seem to be able to define what he means by structural reform, and I suspect that he uh, he doesn't doesn't hasn't done that, didn't do it in the, in the speech that he delivered uh, over the weekend, because uh, he has many uh, different forces within his own political party pulling him in dif- different directions, and we've seen this, I suppose, over the um, the uh, uh, planned approach to the International Monetary Fund for crisis funding related to COVID nineteen with some parts of the ANC dead set against it and others other others led by the likes of uh, finance minister Tito Mboweni in support of it but if the president can't even define what he means by structural reform have we got any hope no well <laughs> there's a two edged sword here one is if he knew yeah and what he meant was bad things we'd be in deep trouble yeah uh, if he knew and what he meant by it was good things we'd be uh, looking at a very bright future mm-hmm. Uh, the fact that he doesn't seem to know what he means, that's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to influence him and those around him. Uh, I just hope he doesn't go and appoint some kind of committee or project or <laughs> I don't know, some commission. Some, there are some commission, some uh, plan, uh, you know, structural adjustment committee or whatever. No, <laughs> I hope he doesn't do that. I hope he actually moves from vagueness which you quite right, that is what characterizes his current position, in the correct direction. And the fact that we don't know it means that people like business organizations, business leadership, South Africa, SACI, NAFCOC, the other business organizations, the think tanks, the Sussman Foundation, the IRR, the Free Market Foundation, can all now influence the government in the right direction. That's what we have to do. We have to pull out the stops. List what has to be done, list the reforms, and be specific, not vague. Mm -hmm. He is vague, which is an opportunity for us to flesh it out with specifics, and that's what we all have to do now. All right, uh, Leon, I am conscious of time, so let's uh, let's change direction a little bit. Let's change tack. Let's talk about the telecommunication sector because Tech Central is, after all, a technology website. And I know that the Free Market Foundation has been quite involved uh, over the uh, in recent years in uh, in fighting some of the government policies that have been coming out. Um, We've, we've seen some interesting developments during the COVID-19 pandemic, including the uh, emergency allocation of radio frequency spectrum to the operators by communications regulator ICASA as part of a go- government um, policies around uh, keeping the economy going during this period. Uh, and uh, the operators seem to be putting that to good use, including we've seen Vodacom launching commercial 5G services uh, in uh, recent months as well, in fact, in recent weeks. Um, there also seems to be a renewed sense of urgency at ICASA to get the uh, to get the licensing of Spectrum done. They're promising that that will be done by the end of the year. Um, the Spectrum auction will have been concluded. Um, is this all uh, reason for optimism about the telecom sector, uh, Leon? Do you think uh, things have shifted markedly in the last year or two? Yes, uh, things, some things have moved in the wrong direction, but let's focus on what's moved in the right direction. Long overdue, and we, as you know, and you too, I think personally, have been Tech Central, been uh, banging away about the need for spectrum allocation and spectrum auction and all the digital migration that hasn't taken place. And for uh, people who aren't familiar with the technology here, that means the inefficient use of wavelengths. Spectrum is really wavelengths in the air radio waves, wireless waves, or whatever, just so people might not know what the word spectrum means technically. Uh, But what has happened is the government has sat on spectrum and smothered, strangled uh, the network operators. They are people like Vodacom and MTN and Celsi and Telcom and now uh, Rain and and, uh, who's the other one? Uh, The six now. Um, And so they have been strangled. They have not been able to get enough spectrum. Now, what that means, again, so you know this, but maybe people listening or watching don't, is that they have to build more towers than they would otherwise have to build. That means a huge amount of money is wasted. And the so-called high cost of data in South Africa is a direct result of the government starving the operators of spectrum. And uh, then they have to do in low-income areas, rural areas, small towns and villages, for example, they have to do what's called re-farming, 
they had to discontinue, for example, old 2G and start replacing it with 3G and 4G and the future 5G and so on. So basically, the government has rendered the industry hopelessly inefficient and expensive by throttling spectrum and withholding spectrum. That has now been released thanks to the COVID crisis. There is a problem, however, Duncan. We must understand that they have not been told that it's permanent. In other words, they asked to invest billions of rands in using the spectrum, which requires them to urgently import technology and machinery and plants and equipment and build things. And then they don't know at the end of it, you know, by the end of the year, will it will be taken away again. So uh, what we urgently and desperately need is a castle to say it's gone, it's permanent, it's in your hands. Please build and please invest and please assume you've got it. That'll bring down our data costs. More importantly, it will improve our efficiency. And let's understand that our, our coverage and our efficiency of our data is one of the best in the world. We compete with the world's first world countries and we even better than some of the first world yeah. countries. And there's something romantic about this. Uh, our telecoms industry, the network cell phone industry, to use the popular term, started in the same year as the New South Africa, 1994. Yeah. It is by far the most fantastic success story in South Africa. Unbelievable. And when people complain about it and criticize the so-called duopoly and so on, which we should still talk about you mm-hmm. and me now, we will. but uh, they just don't understand that this is the most amazing, exciting accomplishment by a very big margin in the New South Africa. We have whatever it is, 97, 98% coverage, which means where people live, they pretty much all get access to to to, uh, to, to ICT, uh, telecommunications technology. And uh, so it is a wonderful success story. We have more operating phones than the entire population, and that's because some people have more than one. And basically everyone who wants one has one, It is an astounding success story. We should celebrate it. And when people want to start damaging the industry and interfering, Mm -hmm. do they know what they're doing? Do they have any idea that we should tell the rest of the world, if you want to know what to do, come here. We'll show you. We've done it. We are the world's great success story. Now, that doesn't mean uh, that there isn't room for improvement. Our data prices are not the highest in the world, though that's a misrepresentation, these means of high prices. But nonetheless... Mm -hmm. We're about average, slightly above average maybe, depending on what you call data and how you measure it. And, you know, if I say to you, one of the country's leading experts, Duncan, what is the cost of data in South Africa? Never mind, how do we compare with the rest of the world? You can't say. It depends on what bundle, what package, whatever, whatever, you know, which company uh, are you big? Is it long term, short term? Is it 24 hours? Is it a month? Is it a year? So there's no such thing as the price of data. There are lots of prices of data, and to make international comparisons is close to impossible. Mm -hmm. But what we can do is we can say it's obviously affordable because almost everyone is using it and getting it. What we can do is make it a lot cheaper, bring the price down by allowing free competition, making markets what's called contestable. Uh, Our Competition Commission, unfortunately, doesn't seem to understand competition theory. I don't know who taught them, apparently nobody, but they don't understand how competition is or what it is or how it works. I'm sorry to say that, but you can't be generous about the misconceptions about about competition and economic theory. So uh, very quickly then, what we need to do in Africa is uh, allow these companies to have the spectrum permanently. Tell them it's yours, it's your property right. Run auctions by all means, but essentially the ones now using particular high bandwidth, high demand spectrum or whatever will pay for it and keep it. Uh, but, but you're quite right. Auction what's available, create real property rights, make it permanent, make it secure and make it enough. I wanted to ask about uh, the auction model because uh, it is controversial. Um, I don't think any spectrum has been allocated in South Africa under an auction. I stand to correction, but I don't think any spectrum has been allocated under an auction model in South Africa to date. Certainly, the three G and two G spectrum that was uh, that was granted to uh, Vodacom, MTN, Cell C, Telcom, and others uh, has been. Um, 
granted on a, I think they call it a beauty contest uh, 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 process rather than, than uh, auctioning it off to the highest bidder. Now, ICAST is talking about licensing uh, Spectrum at the end of this year for 4G and 5G uh, and putting in reserve prices for that Spectrum. I think the figure that was being bandied about was 2 billion rand per lot, if I'm not mistaken. Um, now, this is obviously fantastic news for Tito Mboweni and for the national fiscus, um, because if there's the potential to raise many tens of billions of rand from the telecommunications industry uh, through through an auction process. But is that the right way to go, Leon, do you think, uh, raising all this money for the national fiscus? Obviously, we're in a crisis at the moment and they, can, they need money from wherever they can get it. But... Um, do you think the, the long-term impact on consumers through higher, potentially higher prices uh, makes the, the auction uh, worthwhile at the end of the day? Yes, you, you raise a very, very important point here. If you simply auction off to the highest bidder, uh, that would be like saying in a particular town, we are going to allow one bank and we are going to auction that bank to the highest bidder or maybe two, mm-hmm. and that's all or, you know, two restaurants or two hotels or one hotel or one church, whatever, one club, uh, and then you auction it to the highest bidder. Obviously, then, the one who gets the bid, who pays the highest price, is the one who believes they will be the most efficient user. Yeah. But the point is it will be at maximum price to the consumer. In other yeah. words, they'll say, how much can we charge consumers and get away with this? So they try to squeeze the margin between what they recover from consumers and what they pay in the auction. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I don't uh, have a particular formula myself. I haven't looked around the world, but I think what you probably want is something that makes more spectrum available to more people at effectively lower prices. That'll be in the interests of consumers. Mm -hmm. Quite how you achieve that, I don't know, and I'm sure, Duncan, you know a lot better than me, so I'm not going to be uh, suggesting to you how to do it. You do raise an obviously important point that if you create what people call monopolies, it's a bad use of the term. A monopoly is the sole supplier isn't a monopoly. Uh, a monopoly is only something like Eskom in which competitor, competitors or contestability is not allowed. But nonetheless, if, if a few big ones or small ones, what you want to do is auction it off in what are called bands, the wavelengths, as you well know, uh, in in relatively small amounts locally. And a big, you know, Vodacom or MTN buys it all, that's fine. Uh, But you want to bring the price down to consumers in some way that doesn't purely maximize revenue to the fiscus. Yeah, the the way to do that is... is, uh is uh, the tricky part of this. It can be interesting to see what the uh, the specs for the auction look like when Icasa releases them in the in the coming months. But, um, Leon, I wanted to get your... Sorry. ...particularly good, so don't hold your breath. <laughs> they don't show themselves to really yeah. be on top of this issue. Although, I repeat, we have to be very impressed by South Africa's accomplishment. It's, yeah. it's, it's probably the... You know, it's one of the world's most astonishing... ICT accomplishments. Many people say, Leon, and, and let's talk about this duopoly question, because many people say that MTN and Vodacom, and we hear this often from the regulators, we hear this often from government, but also from, from ordinary consumers who feel they're being ripped off. Many people say that Vodacom and to some extent MTN are too dominant in the telecommunications industry in South Africa, and that therefore it is justified that the government or its regulators get involved uh, to do something about it. Now, we've seen this with the Competition Commission uh, specifically uh, this year, um, signing consent agreements with the uh, mobile operators uh, in which they agreed uh, through uh, through these uh, agreements to cut their retail prices, which seems like a quite an intervention because usually regulators go for the wholesale end of the market rather than the retail end of the market. Um, and we all know what happens when you reg- try to regulate retail prices. Um, I think Venezuela is a classic example of that. Um, what is your take on, on, on this sort of generally, generally widely held view, particularly in government, that Vodacom and MTN are too powerful for, the, uh, for their own good and for the industry and for the health of consumers? Well, let's start by saying the government created them. The government yep. created a duopoly. It licensed only two network operators. So it's, it's completely unjustified in saying it's a problem. That was its choice. 
Yeah. It's what it did. It was the government's deliberate policy was to have only two suppliers. What it did do, which was good, was to let them freely compete. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, two suppliers, the only ones licensed by government, in no sense a duopoly, uh, because they were competing. So they, if they colluded with each other, uh, then uh, they might well have done so, but it's probably much less than people imagine. They were primarily actually competing. Uh, now we have six. Now, the smaller ones call them a duopoly. A duopoly is quite the bad word if it means uh, two people in a monopoly. And uh, let's get that very, very clear. You can have, a, I'm going to use an analogy perhaps anyone can relate to, because if you're talking about big business and multinationals and network operators, it's quite hard for people to grasp what's going on. So I'm going to make it very parochial and simple. I was this morning in a small town called Bakastro. Mm -hmm. Bakastrum used to have only one bank, FNB. Everyone in Bakastrum complained about the banking monopoly in Bakastrum. Only one bank was called a monopoly. Now, if you understand competition, you wouldn't call it a monopoly because any other bank was free to move in. Yeah. In other words, it had to behave itself contestably or efficiently mm -hmm. or competitively in order to remain the sole bank. Then what happened is it decided it wasn't really worth it and it closed. Then all the people of Bokestrom were up in arms because now they'd lost their monopoly, so-called. So, big so <laughs> me, please come back. We need it back. <laughs> so all of a sudden, this villain was the great loss. So the, now there are no banks. Okay. Now let's say, is there banking competition in Bokestrom with zero banks? And the answer is yes, because all banks are free to go there. And if none do, then you can't, if one does, you don't call it monopoly. You call it Santa Claus. You, you, you go and bow in front of it and say, thanks for coming here. And uh, then if another one opens, you're even better off. But one alone would have to be completely competitive and efficient to keep others out. So what MTN and Vodacom have had to do is to do the best they can, to be as efficient and competitive as they can, regardless if they're big. Size is not relevant. Size, you know, I can fire Vodacom tomorrow. It's very easy. Personally, I'm more powerful than them. They have to beg me to supply them with my business and you. So the size does not give them any power at all. What they have to do, they have no power. Consumers have power. Mm -hmm. So what they have to do is they have to find a way of persuading me and you and everyone else to use them instead of someone else. And that's what they're all doing. Mm -hmm. That's what Vodacom does. It's what MTN does, Self C, Telcom. And uh, the market now has six uh, operators. Uh, the government licensed six. It chose to have six. You can't blame the market for that. You can't blame the market for the two dominant ones. They were a deliberate creation of the government. I find it bizarre that the government that purposefully, deliberately created the situation now criticizes it. I mean, how can you criticize the companies rather than the planners? Well, I suppose they, they, um, they'll argue that it was uh, the licensing took place in the dying days of the National Party government in the early 1990s and that it, it wasn't the ANC's decision to license only two players. <laughs> Well, they, they had every opportunity for the last 20, 25 years to license any number of others, and they have now licensed others. But yes. why did they take so long? And why do they still restrict entry? Why don't they simply say this is a completely free, competitive market, anyone can enter, and you mm. regulate standards and all of that the way you do, say, mm. private hospitals or architects, you know, build construction companies. You say anybody is free to build a building. Mm -hmm. But when they build one, they have to build it to the following specs. So you, you, maintain, you regulate safety and quality, but you don't regulate entry. Mm -hmm. Now, a limitless quantity of construction companies. Well, we should have a limitless quantity of network operators. And if one of them persuades everybody to support them, you must understand it is not their fault. It is the consumer's fault. The consumers get what they vote for. Mm. If consumers choose to give all their business completely to one furniture dealer, to one um, chain of supermarkets, 
then that is efficient. That's pro-consumer. You want consumers to have that choice. You, if you force onto consumers suppliers they vote against with their rands, it's a violation of the interests of consumers. Competition policy doesn't regulate suppliers. It regulates consumers by telling consumers from whom they must buy who the consumers might not freely have chosen. So if, for example, as seems likely, one or two of these network operators doesn't survive, goes out of business, and there are fewer left, mm -hmm. and then maybe another one or two, and eventually we back to only two, and maybe eventually to only one. If there's only one that is so good and satisfied consumers so spectacularly that it's the only one that remains in business, we should celebrate it, not condemn it. Mm -hmm. But as long as the market's open, there's the potential for competition. Free, yes. yes. Mm. Exactly. Yeah, if, I, if you can pay or Woolworths or Macro or ShopRite or whoever becomes the sole supplier of groceries in South Africa, then they deserve a statue built to them instead of criticism because mm -hmm. that means they are so good that everyone wanted to buy everything from them. And that should be the right of – that's a consumer right. Mm -hmm. Consumers should have that right to give all their business to Vodacom or MTN or Celsi yeah. or Pain or wherever they want to. Yeah. Liquid. yeah. A lot of people are, will argue that um, the market uh, – that there has to be a licensing process that uh, – uh, the government has to determine the number of players in the market because there's a limited amount of spectrum available. But uh, in a market where spectrum trading is uh, is 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 fully allowed, which isn't which it isn't in South Africa, spectrum trading isn't permitted in South Africa at all at the moment. Although there are plans apparently to change that through amendments to telecommunications legislation, then it does it doesn't matter. You don't need licensing because anyone can come in and purchase spectrum from another player in the market if they need access to it and are confident enough in their business plans to roll out a network. Um, we have some examples of this in the world in unlikely industries. One is the taxi cab industry. In yeah. New York, they have a limited number of taxi cab licenses. And I, last time I checked, it was something like 15,000. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't matter what the number is, but there can be no more taxis than that in New York. But what you can do is you can buy and sell the taxi license. So they yep. trade at, uh, whatever it is, a million dollars each. Uh, and so you can have the New York approach mm -hmm. where the government limits the number of operators that allows them freely to trade their taxis. And then in our case, they spectrum mm -hmm. to buy and sell spectrum. Uh, that you can do. That would be the New York taxi cab approach. Or you can yep. have the Washington City taxi cab, Washington, D.C., whereas they have no limit. Mm -hmm. They simply say anyone who pays whatever it is, $100 or something, has a roadworthy certificate, gets a license, and their limitless quantity of taxis, so there are many, many more per commuter than New York City, mm -hmm. and uh, they compete freely with each other, and you can buy and sell a Washington taxi license, but you wouldn't bother. You just go, you just go to the city council and buy a new one. Yep. In New York, they are very expensive, a few million dollars per taxi. So here we can do the same. Here we can say yeah. we're allocating the spectrum. We're doing it by way of an auction. Uh, we could have some uh, type of auction that means that it's not so highly priced that it uh, uh, penalizes consumers. And then we allow absolute free trade in spectrum. Let people mm. buy and sell it, including newcomers, new entry. Leon, it's been a great discussion. Uh, before I let you go, I do want to pick up again on the Competition Commission. You, you were quite sharply critical of them, and I, I want to get your views on competition regulators generally, maybe as a starting point. Do, do you think uh, in a proper, proper free market economy, there's actually a role for, uh, for antitrust and, and competition regulators? No, there's a myth around, a meme, that the spontaneous market leads to market concentration and monopoly. There's no evidence for this, whatever. The freer economies in the world, like Hong Kong, Mauritius, so and have a, an explosion of small and independent business. Quite the opposite. There's no tendency, whatever, towards concentration when economies are freer, markets are freer. Uh, so that's just a factual error. It's not what, in fact, happens. Uh, our Competition Commission uh, has a weird mixture of the American approach, which concerns itself with market share, mm -hmm. and the European approach, which concerns itself with market conduct. So we have, in a sense, the worst of both worlds. Now, market share is irrelevant. Market share is the choice of consumers. 
our competition commission should never talk about market share. It should never be on the agenda. It should be none of its business. It should be the business of consumers to decide who has what market share. Then as to market conduct, uh, pretty much all of the time they talk about so-called collusion. Another word for collusion is joint venture, participation, partnership. These are, you, you can call it collusion and it sounds bad, <laughs> but what typically happens is companies collude to be efficient for consumers. In other words, let's say, for example, ShopRite and, and Woolworths start colluding, meaning cooperating, having a joint venture. What they do is they go and they buy the suppliers together. They increase demand, they lower prices, they bring about distribution efficiencies, they have joint labeling, whatever it is they do, the, the branding. They, they come, they, they, when they cooperate, what they're doing is they're finding a way of being more competitive. Now, this is very hard for people to understand that collusion is a competitive strategy. In other words, you get together with somebody and you say, how can we be better at competing with pick and pay and macro, for example? Mm -hmm. And uh, so they, they just do not understand it. The question is that people should be free to enter into whatever collaborative arrangement they wish. It is almost always pro-consumer. It is always a way of bringing down the price. It is always a way of improving efficiency and economies of scale, almost always, with very few exceptions. And this should be allowed, and they have got a completely false conception of competition policy. The, the correct policy is one and one policy only, and that is contestability, contestability theory. Mm -hmm. uh, and contestability theory says that as long as you in Tech Central, if there's freedom of entry for people to compete with you, and me in the Free Market Foundation, if anyone else can start a policy institute, no matter we are contestable. Even if we're the only free market policy institute, which we aren't, RR and others are, yeah. uh, but nonetheless, the question for Tech Central is, can anybody compete with you? If they may, then you have to behave competitively. You have to be pro-consumer. And if you and the Free Market Foundation enter into some collaboration deal to make, uh, to make your outfit Tech Central, to make the Free Market Foundation more efficient, Mm -hmm. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. The fact that they call it collusion is a, is using a, a, a bad name for a good thing. It should be called cooperation, joint venture, partnership. What about the, the example of, um, we've seen them uh, taking uh, on uh, retailers and supply, uh, other suppliers of uh, PPEs, personal protective equipment during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I think uh, they were one of the largest uh, um, pharmacy chains in the country was fined a large amount of money uh, for allegedly uh, inflating the price of uh, face masks. Um, do you th is there any justification for them getting involved in, 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 in that in these emergency times? No, because they have absolutely no idea what the most efficient way to allocate a shortage of face masks is. Right. Nobody has ever thought of a better way of doing that than price. In other words, people who don't have one, you can't walk in and buy the whole box and walk out. Mm -hmm. That is what you will do if there's a shortage and the price is kept artificially low. Is All you will do is you will promote an illegal, illicit market or you will promote people buying big supplies and going and selling them at premium prices in, for example, tribal villages or townships or locations or whatever. Mm -hmm. So no, they have, they, there is no science, there is no logic by which they can say that that particular chain should not have charged more. On the contrary, all of the science tells you that if there's a shortage, you, you ration it by charging more. That's right. what you must do. If right. there's a shortage of, of Moet champagne, uh, then what you do is you charge more. Uh, if there's a shortage of you know, fashion garments or diamonds or gold or anything else, you charge more. That's what you do. And to say that you must charge less, all you do is you exacerbate the shortage, you make it worse, and you make the product unavailable to people who really need it. In other words, people who are willing to pay more yeah. are denied access to the product. And that is precisely what happened in the beginning when there was a shortage of face masks. Now they're everywhere. Now the Competition Commission doesn't say, sorry, we were wrong. Why are there face masks everywhere? Because people making them and importing them saw an opportunity. They said, look at this. 
there's a shortage. Let's supply. And what you then do is you bring the price down. So the high price is what attracts the competitor. That's what you want when there's a shortage. Yep. You want a high price to bring in more product and overcome a shortage of supply. So the temporary spike in pricing should be, should be temporary. The temporary price is a signal. Mm-hmm. You know, let's say, for example, to, let's say with the lifting of the liquor uh, restrictions. Yes. Let's assume there was a, a huge shortage of, um, I don't know, white wine. Uh, mm-hmm. Chardonnay, I, don't, I don't drink and I don't smoke, so I don't know these things. But Chardonnay, mm-hmm. you know, there's a shortage. And everyone buys it and it's all sold out. That's a very good thing because it means that people are going to find more, bring it here, import it, bring it from neighboring states, start selling the stuff they have in their cellar. That will increase the supply. Mm. And that's what a price spike does. And if you don't have the price spike, you perpetuate the shortage. Yeah, yeah. And I suspect I know the answer to my final question to you, Leon, uh, about the um, Competition Commission intervening in the telecommunications industry in recent months and specifically telling the mobile operators that they have to reduce their headline retail prices. Um, I think the one uh, figure that's been bandied about a lot out of that process was that uh, the headline price of a one gigabyte data bundle would drop from 149 Rand to 99 Rand and uh, MTN, uh, Vodacom and other operators signed these consent agreements. In fact, I think it was only Vodacom and MTN that were required to sign the consent agreements under the findings of the data services market inquiry. Um, I, I th- as I said, I think I know your answer to this question, but uh, do you think the uh, Competition Commission has overstepped its mark and do you think it's going to damage the industry in the short to medium term? It is. It is going to have a very simple consequence, which is less investment by Vodacom and MTN. Uh, the reason we have this fantastic market in South Africa with more cell phones than people, more active SIM cards than people, more active accounts, is precisely because they were able to recover enough to build the towers, to build the 90, I mean, you might know the number, let's call it 98% coverage, Mm -hmm. but it approaches 100%. This is because they could recover enough money, and now that we're going into 5G, and much of the country, most of the country doesn't yet have 4G, so what we want to do is we want to say it must be rewarding enough for them to invest two, three, four, five billion per annum in building towers and 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 uh, and subsidising handsets, which they both do. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, what the Competition Commission is doing is reducing their ability to invest, reducing access to services to consumers, and ultimately not only raising the ultimate price to consumers but making South Africa fall behind the world in technology. If you want us to go 5G, if you want us to go... But 5G, by the way, is a thing we should really maybe not talk about too much. We still want 3G and 4G in a lot of the country. (laughs) And uh, what we need to do is create every possible incentive we can for the mobile network operators to go and do the uh, billions of rands of investment that's required. Leon Lowe is Executive Director of the Free Market Foundation. Leon, it's always fantastic to talk to you. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk to Tech Central today. Thank you, Duncan, and to the viewers and listeners. It's absolutely my honor. And if I may say, you do great work yourself, and it's very much admired and respected. And well done. Well, thank you very much.